we're going to be talking about cybersecurity and privacy research and its impact. Uh, and so before I get into that, before we get into the panel, I do just want to say a word about the Cybersecurity and Privacy Institute at Northeastern. Um, so the institute, where I'm executive director, uh, was founded in 2016. We have 14 core faculty, five affiliate faculty. Institutes at Northeastern are not just one college. You've heard a lot about interdisciplinarity here. That's exactly what institutes were created for. So we span Corey College, College of Engineering, uh, uh, School of Law, and the College of Arts, Media, and Design. And we continue to grow. Um, so our mission, as you can imagine, is to safeguard today's computer systems. We have expertise in a wide range of areas, traditional computer security, software, firmware, um, networks. We've also done uh, extensive work in cryptography, but also we're addressing today's emerging threats. We're talking about data privacy, how algorithms are exploiting data and potentially using them in ways that are harmful to society. You already heard about artificial intelligence and how great it is. Of course, these are also targets for attack and manipulation, and these are areas where we also have a focus. Um, just to brag a little bit about the Institute, you already heard about some of the impact Corey has had in general. Um, we have attracted very large National Science Foundation grants, things like an online observatory to be able to see what people see online when they interact with the large companies that collect and use our data. Um, also, a National Science Foundation Secure and Trustworthy Computing $10 million Frontiers grant um, to protect data privacy online. And our faculty and students have won awards in competitions, uh, DARPA Spectrum Challenges, CTFs, and so forth. Um, so generally speaking, as an institute, we want to have impact on the real world. We're not here to just publish papers and collect award money. Um, we want to go out there and work with our partners. Um, that means working with industry partners, working with policymakers, working with journalists, and getting our research into the hands of those who can actually use it to affect change. Um, so that is, of course, the theme for today. Um, I am actually filling in for, as you already heard, uh, Alan Mislove, who is now in the White House Office of Technology, uh, Science and Technology Policy um, and is not allowed to be on a panel with an independent agency like the FTC. He can't talk about all the great stuff that he's done, but I can do it for him. Uh, includes, for example, work on understanding how Facebook was collecting data and using it in ways that they lied about. Uh, it was cited even in the Federal Trade Commission's $5 billion fine for violation of their previous consent decree. Um, so we are actively out there as an institute, our faculty trying to have impact on the real world. And today we're gonna to hear from our panelists about more broadly how cybersecurity and privacy research can have that impact. So I could spend a while doing the introductions myself, but what I'm gonna ask our panelists to do instead is introduce themselves and not only mention what their role is, but also how they've used research to have impact in their organizations or professions. So we'll just go down the line starting with Julia. Hi there, I'm Julia Angwin. I'm um, a longtime investigative journalist currently writing for New York Times Opinion about tech policy. Um, I am a huge believer in using the scientific method and the um, approach to rigor in data analysis that academia uses and I like want to bring that and have been bringing that to journalism. In an era where people are increasingly mistrustful of the news, I think journalists need to step up and work harder to show how they got the facts that they got. And I'm here in large part because Alan, David, Christo have been partners with me for more than a decade in helping me vet the work that I've been doing, I bring it to experts to say, hey, am I doing the statistical analysis right? Or sometimes use their data sets and findings to do additional work. So I feel like I'm, I'm not an industry partner, but I am a partner to um, Corey and Northeastern and really just thrilled to be here. Hi, everyone. So I'm Daniel Dubois, and I'm a research scientist in, in the Corey College from the last six years. And uh, well, I'm not an industry partner, but I do very impactful re research. And uh, I work on internet of things, and I do security and privacy research on that. So this is a very impactful. For example, most of you have IoT devices at home, and some of you might be afraid of them because they are always connected to the internet. So who wants to have a microphone owned by someone else at home? 
So what we do is we study these devices by interacting with them every day, and then we see if they are actually uh, sharing the data or not. And we have seen like many cases uh, where this actually happens. And usually what we do is that we have our students, we train ourselves, and then when something bad happens, we will, we will publish a paper. But sometimes these are, these, what we find is so bad that even the press is interested in what we, in what we find. <laughs> so for example, like we have been in New York Times that was interested in some of our like, uh, smart speakers that were actually recording conversations with when you were not actually saying their, their work word, which is like probably most of you are afraid of that. And I know people that will never want those devices at home, but most of you have cell phones and maybe you have like Siri or something else like that that is actually listening to you. So everybody is really like affected by this. And, um, and basically what we are doing is that we are exposing this and developing methodologies that can be um, like reused and allow us to, um, to find more instances of these problems. What we have seen is that other like um, companies, like for example, Consumer Report, like a consumer advocacy organizations are interested in our works and they even offer like some grants for us to work with them so that we can like, help her and share our like methodology with them. And uh, during one of my travels in Italy, where I'm from, like the privacy uh, agency of Italy actually wanted to meet with me and my research group to talk about that because a lot of these devices by sharing data intentionally or not are violating privacy laws, which are very strict in some places. And we, want to, we are working with them to help them detect cases like these. Hi everyone, my name is Stephanie Wynn. I'm the Chief Technologist for the US Federal Trade Commission. I'm also compelled to say I'm not an industry partner. I'm a <laughs> federal government uh, employee. Uh, really excited to be here, just so inspired by the words from this morning, all of you, many familiar faces of having seen, read, uh, invited many of you to come talk at the FTC because we also believe in research for impact, research for help, to help for um, instilling confidence in our uh, attorneys on what we're learning, what is the most cutting edge research on topics that have just been mentioned here. Starting out with a little bit of my background, I'm the daughter of Vietnamese refugees. I grew up in a household uh, rooted in the idea of innovation for opportunities uh, for a better life. And that is something that really has stuck with me in everything that I've done. Um, in college, uh, I made my own major and called it digital media theory and design, which I, uh, translation is really how tech helps people and how tech hurts people. So I've spent my winding career in different industries, um, academia, federal government agencies, um, research institutions, really thinking about how does technology translate into these harms. So we spent a ton of time on the ground working with people, think uh, students with loan default getting crushed by their learn loan servicers, working with immigrants who are trying to navigate the process of coming to a new country. Um, thinking about how small business restaurant owners um, are getting slammed with junk fees that they can't translate. Uh, and so in many ways, this has brought me here to the Federal Trade Commission, where our mission here is to fight unchecked corporate power and to focus on uh, deceptive and unfair business practices. So very broad mandate. We govern an entire economy of matters, ranging from tuna fish labeling to uh, tractor supply manufacturing to big tech companies. Um, and so I'm so excited and here today to kind of talk a little bit more about what we're doing. Um, in February, the FTC announced uh, the Office of Technology, a team that I'm leading with the best technologists in the country um, and our mandate is sort of focused on three different areas. First um, is to strengthen and support our cases and enforcement. We are working directly with attorneys on the biggest cases of our time. 
Second, we act as subject matter experts to work with our uh, friends in Congress, uh, with uh, agencies abroad, um, and with folks internally on translating complex black box business practices into something that we can use to enforce the law. And third, using our non-enforcement powers and tools to translate our words into bat signals, uh, into the ecosystem, to work with many of you, to be here, to learn about what you're doing, to bring your knowledge into the agency, like I mentioned before. So again, very excited to be here, very excited to, to learn more and meet many of you. Thank you. Happy. Hello? Uh, so uh, I, <laughs> I'm a I'm not sure I should be on the panel. <laughs> uh, I, I've been just a, I, I'm, I've been an academic, a researcher in cryptography for the past few years. And um, I think my ticket here is that uh, last year uh, I saw an opportunity to take one of my uh, papers, you know, algorithms that I'd worked on, actually with students that have just graduated, all four of them now on the paper have graduated. Uh, these these were my first set of students here at Northeastern. Um, so that set of papers, I like it, speaking to what they accomplished, they help, uh, you know, exactly with the mission that you just saw the students on the video say, uh, you know, enhance the dignity and, and protect the privacy of uh, of, of users. So I had that protocol and I had an opportunity to meet uh, some people at Google, some executives at Google. I pitched this idea. They were interested. So I uh, was able to organize an opportunity, thanks to Beth, uh, to, to work at Google to try to get this protocol uh, in, incorporated into a pretty popular uh, platform. And uh, so that's why I'm on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> And that, that has been successful in some sense and not successful in another. And I guess we'll get to that later on in the panel. But that's yep. me. Yes. Thank you, Avi. I was going to say not so much later on, because I think we're going to go right back to that. But I'll, I'll tell you and tell the audience, why, why is Avi here? Um, so uh, I mentioned our institute really does focus on partnering with um, uh, external partners. Um, some of them are uh, in, in journalism, we work with policymakers, but we also um, work with industry, and we do a lot of that. That's a great way to have impact. And so um, I did want to start uh, with a question to Abi. Um, you know, there's a lot of us in academia who just do write papers, and it doesn't really go anywhere else. Um, and so my question to you is sort of how did you find yourself coming across this opportunity, which you talked about a little bit, to work with a large industry partner, to take some of your fundamental research and then transfer it into industry, to transfer it into a product? And you know, basically, what has worked well with that? What can we learn um, as researchers in terms of how we can translate our research into, uh, into products? So how did it happen? I think it was luck favors the prepared. So I was just giving talks and uh, somehow incorp encountered the right people. Uh, and, 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 and you know, the executives at, at large companies, they're all curious intellectuals uh, who also have a responsibility, like a big responsibility. So uh, I, somehow that struck a note with the, the, the sponsor of this work that I'm on right now. Um, I had a good relationship with that person, and they, they sponsored essentially the projects that I'm working on. Now, what have I learned? Is that the second part of it? Sort or? Of what has worked well in terms of being able to have impact to go beyond just the paper? Uh, so what has worked well? Um, so just being, so being present, uh, you know, being in the room where discussions are happening and being able to put a perspective, I would say that's the most successful thing I've done. The technical work is, uh, you know, you get the resources of a large company and then the engineers and, and, and sort of that, that works really well. Uh, but then, you know, the thing that I've learned is essentially most, most of these endeavors are uh, basically bound to fail. <laughs> uh, you know, academic work, like my work especially, I won't speak for other academics, um, it's, it, we cut corners. We, we don't exactly talk about all of the corner cases that occur in the real world. And, uh, you know, just to give you a sense, like, you know, a 1%, you know, with 1% users having a problem, uh, that's, that's enormous. But, you know, even 10 basis points or even one basis point of a user, like 1%, point, like 1.001% 
percent of the people uh, who are on this platform, if they have an issue, that's basically causing an error every second, more more than an error every second of the day, and and they're you know there's really no way for them to recover from these things. So you have to handle all of these special cases, uh, and those are things that people like myself aren't even aware of until you get into the setting of uh, basically understanding how you know big organizations deal with these things. I, I don't know if that's a good answer. But. <laughs> it sounds like you've learned a lot along the way. I have learned a lot. <laughs> and I think positively I've had some influence. My project has gone up and down and up, and now it's on the up swing again. Hopefully it succeeds and you know gets launched. Um, <laughs> but yes, I've, I've learned a lot about how the world works. So. All right, well, well, hopefully you will be able to tell us about it sometime soon. I guess that means it wasn't announced at Google I.O., yeah? Well, actually, uh, yes. If you, if you go back and, uh, and listen to two words that both Sundar and James Manika said, uh, they said words that, uh, that I've had influence on. So that's kind of cool, too. <laughs> awesome. Two words, maybe next year, three. Um, awesome. Maybe a demo next year. But. Yeah. All right. Um, thanks, Avi. So, uh, Stephanie, I want to switch to you next. So, um, you know, as you mentioned, uh, the agency uh, has a broad mandate um, when it comes to consumer protection, and specifically the focus of this panel is cybersecurity and privacy, which is deeply enmeshed in nearly every aspect of our uh, digital lives these days. So, um, given that broad area, um, what are priority areas for the agency in terms of enforcement where researchers are likely to have the most impact? Such a great question. Um, I'm going to kind of translate what you're saying into how a lot of folks on our team think about our work, which is, what is the problem we are solving? Always starting with the problem. What is hurting people on the ground, real people in communities today that you know? What is something that you can translate to the people in your life? Um, sometimes those harms may not be felt immediately, right? Sometimes they're like, way upstream in the process, so they're not quite there yet. Uh, but in terms of how we view problems, the first problem that I wanna talk about um, is the fact that, again, my background is in design. Uh, design is inextricable from the business models that it is attached to. Design cannot be viewed as just a pattern alone that is good or bad. You must understand the context for which it is used. I know there's been cutting edge research from Northeastern on this exact topic. Um, but with our cases, for example, we had um, recent cases, uh, GoodRx and BetterHelp, which is two healthcare platforms. And the case involved uh, data collection um, through the use of pixel tracking. Um, and it was unknowingly to the users, shared to third party uh, actors, companies, um, sensitive data involving their health. And so things like this do not happen by accident. Um, so just something to keep in mind. The second sort of area that we focus on is looking at the default. There are choices made in every single product that we use, whether it is observable to a human or whether it is a backend system architecture design item. And so defaults, again, are often optimized for companies as opposed to the humans that may use that system or product. Um, and so uh, looking to a case that um, the FTC came out with our staff worked on, Fortnite, you may have heard of it. Um, there was a, a default setting that was on by default that collected audio data from kids, um, potentially leading them to uh, health harm, um, sexual harassment, real life harms, um, given that there's so many people on the platform. Um, and then third is sort of a big picture one, again, may not be felt immediately, but there are potentially seismic shifts that are occurring in our economy. Um, think our, we just put out a, a request for information on cloud computing. This is an example of that, where there may be single points of failure in um, a system that essentially is underpinning much of our economy. Think transportation, think national security, think healthcare. Um, so this is an area of interest that we are tracking, both in terms of uh, security vulnerabilities and how companies are creating defaults to optimize for that. And then secondly, 
uh, the impacts of market power. What happens when there are a few actors in the market who are sustaining an industry? So these are questions that we are asking to the public. We are early in the process and really trying to gather the, the brightest you know, folks who are working on this topic to help shape our thinking on this work. Great, thank you so much. Um, so moving down the line, um, Daniel, um, you uh, were for a year a Consumer Reports Digital Labs fellow, so Consumer Reports, which is an organization many of you may know about if you're my age. They were you know, the little magazines uh, at the checkout counter um, for products, physical products. Um, but increasingly, the products we interact with today are digital in nature. So Consumer Reports has established a digital lab. Um, Daniel was one of the original fellows of that lab to help, um, to help them come into the digital age. Um, so my question to you, Daniel, is um, how has your work with a consumer advocacy organization like Consumer Reports helped translate some of your research from academia into impact uh, in, in the real world? So that's a really good question. So before I answer, like I want to underline the word like consumer of consumer reports. So just by this, you know that they focus on consumers, which is basically all of us. So what they do actually has an impact. They try to increase awareness of something, which is basically why the, what they do is actually so related to what we do. In the digital lab, they focus on um, IoT device and other digital products. And when I did a fellowship with them, I was able to um, work with them and share my knowledge, and also they were able to share the knowledge with me. What, the reason why this worked is that we share a mission together. So we both are, care about what these devices are doing. Consumer Reports cares because they want to tell people, well, if you buy these, you have these risks. This product is better than this other. So they established some methodology to compare these products. But what we do in our lab, in the university here, we actually do something similar. We analyze this in a different way, these same devices, and then we can find out that, well, you have a risk of this or that. So the good thing is that these methodology are not the same, they are complementary. So we were able to, like, by working with them, I was able to tell them, well, you can build a system like this. We did it here in Northeastern, and then they find a well, that might work, and then they started to build that. At the same time, they told me, this is, these are like the product that we test. This is how we do that. And then we, we decided to test the products. In my case, we were testing like uh, voice assistants and smart speakers, and we weren't trying to see if they were, like, if the bad things we have seen during research, they could happen at, at a scale. And then we did a lot of experiments for that. So what we have seen is that we've, we've seen the situations where this system were not behaving as people would have expected. And then I gave the, these results back to consumer reports. And uh, the good thing is that when you like, talk with them, they give you some feedback and some perspective on how to do the experiments that you didn't think in the, when you do like a, an academic paper. And the second thing is that when you find something interesting, they will publish that. So there is like a faster way to increase public awareness and to let them know what's happening. Some of these results, if we put them in a research paper, the paper will not be accepted until there is a lot of innovation of, of the methodology. But sometimes we, want, we just want a simple answer. Can you trust something or not? So are, are you at risk if you use like this smartwatch or not? And then that's basically like the, the main benefit. And uh, another thing about working with other organizations like Consumer Reports is that they focus on a lot of other things and fellows like me were able to see what they were doing. And this like, allowed me to work also on different things that were a bit beyond like, cybersecurity and privacy. For example, we were like during the pandemic where I did a fellowship, there were like most people were transitioning to um, to using like Meet and other like video, video conferencing systems. And then they were think, they were questioning, well, are these systems uh, working the same for everybody or not? And then we, we did some comparative studies in the different contexts in the past, but this like uh, gave us the idea to, well, let's test these systems with a lot of voices for like people from different genders and other, per and other characteristics. And then we have seen that they don't behave in the same way. There is some sort of kind of a bias and, uh, and um, that makes these products better for certain categories of people than other. And this is the type of like, uh, 
uh, interdisciplinarity that actually we want, so that we can make an impact and, and use the techniques that we learn in one area and apply it to another. And I learned a lot of this, of this experience, and Consumer Reports also, they learned from me, and we both made an impact to the public. Great, thank you, Daniel. Julia, last but not least on this row. Um, so you know, what I found is your work through investigative journalism and what we do as researchers just shares a lot in common. We apply the scientific method, um, we try to find impactful problems and then publish about them. Um, but also if we just publish it and leave it out there uh, for people to read, sure people get some awareness, but that doesn't always mean that anything changes. So. Um, what's been your experience through the markup and through other experiences um, in your career to transitioning or translating those stories that took an enormous amount of effort into actual impact, actual change in the world? Um, that's such a good question. I would say that like one thing that um, it might look from the academic side of point of view, like, oh, we're all getting all this impact over here in journalism, but I would say that most of the journalists I talk to, we spend a lot of time talking about how depressing it is to write something <laughs> and have no impact, <laughs> especially when you show something so clearly that is so clearly wrong and then nothing changes. So I always try to counsel the reporters I work with, like, look, it's a long game. You know, you don't always get impact right away, but putting this information out into the public is a service. It does change the discourse. It does lead to um, changes. I've had many times stories that I've written a decade ago that will be some sort of change. I remember when I wrote about how um, there was a smart TV out there that was being marketed and they basically, it said in their privacy policy, like we plan to sell all your data about everything you're watching to advertisers. And um, it was actually just all out in the open, like they didn't require any investigation and it, it said in their SEC filings like we're gonna make tons of money off this um, and so you know it took a while but there was like an FTC case and then they eventually like I think almost five six years later ended up taking that off the market so it does take time but when I wrote the story everyone was like oh that seems bad and then moved on you know and so there's always like this sort of time that it takes for things to happen um, but one the thing that really has led me to be doubling down on data-driven journalism and the scientific method is I do believe that data is the currency that causes policymakers to act. So a very good example of this is a story when I did when I was at ProPublica. So I was looking at something that had been written about quite a lot in academic circles, which was the rise of things called risk assessments in the criminal legal system. So essentially, in Across the US, in every jurisdiction, they use these algorithmic instruments to determine the riskiness of people that are either up for um, pretrial release or for sentencing or for parole. So at various stages of the legal system, um, they would make an assessment of how risky this person is. And so I looked at this, I think this was about 2015, and I saw there was tons and tons of literature. Actually, all these legal scholars had written that the kind of questions they asked in those risk assessments were definitely proxies for race. And so they were going to be, by definition, the answers were going to be racially biased. So there were going to be different answers for different racial groups. And there was um, actually the attorney general at the time, Eric Holder, had given a speech saying, these look like they're going to be perpetuating the racial bias that we already know exists in the criminal legal system. And he had publicly called the US Sentencing Commission and called for them to do an investigation of the racial bias of these systems. So I read all this and I thought, huh, I wonder what's going on. So I called up the Sentencing Commission and was like, are you going to do the study that Eric Holder wants you to do? And they were like, no, nah, we got a lot of other things. We're really busy. And so I was like, I guess I'll do it. So I went and it took a lot of time to collect the data. So essentially I went down, I, f I went and looked around the country. Where could I get data about these risk scores and how they were working? I found that um, if you guys don't know this, Florida has the best open records laws. So I went to Florida, got all the risk scores in a jurisdiction there that had been assigned to every defendant over a two year period, got that data looked at it and realized the only way I was going to be able to assess the fairness of it was to see whether those people had gone on to, to commit the crime that they were predicted to commit, right? So basically this score aimed to say in the next two years, you will go on to commit a future crime. 
which is a little crazy, by the way. Um, and so I had to scrape all the records from the public, you know, system that showed who had been arrested for what, and then match them to those scores, which was, if anyone knows, you guys are all computer scientists, as a huge scrape and a huge join based on only birth date and name, totally gruesome, do not recommend. <laughs> but out of a data set of 18,000 people, we were able to get 7,000 clean records of like people where we could say whether they had gone on to be arrested for a future crime in the next two years. And then when we looked at that data, we found, big surprise, it was racially biased. So black defendants were twice as likely to be falsely listed as high risk compared to white defendants, and white defendants were twice as likely to be falsely labeled as low risk compared to black defendants. So there was a huge disparity in the error rates. Now, I will say that this article was sort of a win and a loss. So basically, in the computer science community, it created an incredible field of research. I have more citations to this article than my husband, who's a professor at Columbia. And so <laughs> I lord that over him every single day. Um, but um, it created a whole field of research about algorithmic bias, m much of which pursued by faculty here. It has led to a lot of um, questions and understanding in the computer science community. However, in the criminal legal community, um, there has been no change. This algorithm is still being used. This was almost 10 years ago, eight years ago that I published this story. Um, there has been some recognition that these algorithms could be biased, so occasionally states will pass laws saying those algorithms shouldn't be biased. I don't know, that seems like a win, but not really, because there's no independent testing of those algorithms because it's very expensive. You know, the jurisdiction that I tested in Florida, they were so happy I was doing this. They were like, we can't afford to spend a year compiling and joining all this data. We don't even know if it works. We've been using it for 10 years, by the way. They were like, they were totally happy to use it, but had no idea how effective it was. So I guess what I would say is that putting the data on the table changed the conversation. So there had already been lots of conversation about how these were potentially biased. Putting a data set out there led to A, replication. So academia replicated my work and was able to validate it. And so that was really important. That led to a lot of policy conversations in the computer science field and also in policy circles, although it hasn't led to a lot of legislative outcomes. But I do think that data made it concrete. Whereas before we had the data, it was just a conversation. And so that's why I believe in data-driven journalism, because I think the conversations these days, as crazy as it is out there in politics, we still do want to create, ground it in evidence and in data. And so the more data, I view my job as bringing data to the table so that the conversation can be better informed. That's a great story. And also a great segue to the next question, which just um, keying off of, uh, uh, organizations not having the resources to do the kind of work that you did. Um, Stephanie, you mentioned the creation of the Office of Technology. Um, and so obviously in academia or in uh, investigative journalists, we can independently go out and do some things. But um, I would imagine that the Office of Technology would allow technologists in the agency to look into similar types of things. So I guess my question to you is we you know, look into the audience and there's students, there's uh, researchers, there's people who might want uh, to become researchers. Um, how can cybersecurity and privacy researchers interact with the Office of Technology? And what are ways that you're um, sort of planning to be able to use the Office of Technology um, to, to have impact um, in areas like Julia mentioned, but just beyond in terms of um, being able to do the kinds of investigations that previously weren't resourced? Something that a bunch of the panelists up here have mentioned is this theme of things move fast and we need to have the people in place, the processes in place, and the right outputs in order to try and see the change we want to do to, to shift incentives in the marketplace, right? Um, and so um, for us, one big question that we are thinking through as we're building out the team is how do we ensure that the folks that we hire are able to nimbly move when traditionally, right, academic publication timelines and processes um, we'll see many cycles of new technologies by the time that we've wrapped our minds around it. And so in general, I would say we need people who are on the beat, like people who understand new um, technologies as they emerge. 
generative AI, as many of you have talked about already. Um, and I think being okay to not have all the precise, fully formed answers yet, what questions should we be asking as a regulatory agency? And so I would say the most helpful types of information um, that we would love to see from outside researchers are number one, the harms, concretely. How are things happening to people in the world and at what scale? And how do you know? What information is out there? Um, number two, potential targets. Like, who's doing this stuff? How can we grapple with what the industry is kind of seeping into? The fact that we went from zero to hundreds of millions of users in months is insane. And so to get a better sense of like where is technology kind of impacting different types of industries and sectors and communities is something that's important to us. Um, and then third is just that process piece. Like we wanna talk to you all. Um, we wanna have conversations with you before everything is fully baked. Um, and we wanna know what you're doing. So you know, if, if there are ways that you can get your information out into the world in a way that, you know, asks questions, gets at some types of themes that you're seeing, helps us understand what we should be looking at. Those are the types of things that are really, really helpful. Great, thank you. And then following up again now with back to you, Julia, you mentioned you know uh, data-informed journalism and, and that being incredibly important going forward. Um, one of the challenges is that as we measure systems, we're typically you know, applying the scientific method, you sort of measure the system, you look for the same answer to come out, uh, either all the time or often to be able to draw a conclusion about is the system biased or not. Um, we're increasingly, however, moving into a world where the models are constantly changing under the covers. We don't see what the models are, they keep changing. Um, we talked about earlier today generative AI. So now the data that you're investigating is changing and maybe made up. It may just you know, be com complete nonsense uh, created by a chatbot. Um, so my question to you is, what are the challenges for investigative journalism uh, in the face of this sort of new way of doing things? And how do you see going forward in this environment? Um, that's such a great question. Um, I mean, first of all, I want to build a nonsense meter, obviously. <laughs> Don't we want like nonsense level for all of our <laughs> generative AI? Yes. So I have dreams. Um, but I think like the, the thing is that um, we're moving into a world of what you're, what, you, what I would call dynamic outputs, right? And so, uh, but I would say that that is okay. It's a little bit more okay for journalists because journalism is always sort of just taking snapshots in time of a dynamic output. Like what is war reporting? You're taking a picture at a moment during a dynamic situation. And so I think journalism has this tradition of witness, right? Where we just, we are here to witness these moments on behalf of the public. And I view the work I do as sort of essentially that war reporting inside the computer, right? So it's like basically, um, it's a war in here. I'm taking a lot of pictures. And so essentially, I wanna take those pictures and I know that they will be static and they won't be the full representation, but they are on behalf of the public that can't see inside at all, right? And so I think that it's important to accept the limitations of the work that I do and also, Additionally, use computation to automate it. So the nice thing is that I can do persistent monitoring by automating some of those pictures that are inside the machine. So one pro project that I did when I was at the Markup, a nonprofit newsroom that I founded in 2018 that I've just left, basically we did this year-long study of what was going on inside Facebook's algorithm. So everybody is always asking, what is Facebook's algorithm doing? We have no idea. Why is it showing me this? Why is it showing me that? So I decided, like, okay, the only way to really take a really hard look at this is to essentially do survey research. So to build a national panel that is representative of the United States population. So I worked with a survey research firm, got them to have those people who are paid to participate in this survey they installed a tool that we built and it allowed us to constantly monitor their Facebook feed. What we did was, just in case you're panicking about privacy, we stripped out all the identifying details before we even could see the data. So we had an automatic process of redaction, so we couldn't even technically access the data until all information was removed about them, their friends, et cetera. Um, 
but they had self-identified to us with age, gender, geographic, location, race, and political affiliation. So we had this nice ability to say, like, Trump voters are getting, for instance, prior to January 6th, Trump voters are getting recommended a lot of political groups that are organizing an event on January 6th at the Capitol. And so we could look back retrospectively and be like, that was interesting, because Mark Zuckerberg had testified in Congress just two months earlier saying, during the election period, the sacred time, we will not recommend political groups to our users. And actually, that was not true. Um, and we could show that it was disproportionately happening to Trump if Trump voters, right, not to the Biden voters. And so we had this persistent monitoring system running for about 18 months, and it was called a, the Citizen Browser Project. You can look it up on the markup.org, and it we broke tons and tons of stories about the Facebook algorithm and what it was doing. And so I do think that automation and computation actually can serve journalists, too, to help them be the war reporters inside the machine. Great, thanks so much. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, project was sort of inspiration in part for our National Internet Observatory project here at Northeastern, where we are installing software that will monitor what our participants see online, uh, on their web browsers, on their mobile devices, so then we could see what Facebook and many other companies are doing um, and make this data available to other researchers. So, uh, I'm very excited about that project, <laughs> and I would like my hands on that data as soon as possible. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we are getting uh, close to the end of our time, so I want to move to just some final thoughts. So I'm just going to pose this question. If you had just one thing, and just one, because we're running out of time, that you could give in terms of advice to our students, our researchers, anyone who would like to have impact, you know, take their uh, cybersecurity and privacy research and turn it into impact, what would it be? And I'm going to start all the way on that end with Avi. I know, unfair. <laughs> the, the person with the least impact among all the people uh, on the panel, uh, what is my advice? Um, I don't know, seize the moment, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Carpe diem. Okay. Uh, Stephanie. <laughs> Uh, mine would be to follow the incentives uh, if you actually want to create change. What is actually going to shift people's incentives? Thank you. So my suggestion is, like, if you want to have impact, set some goals, impactful goals, then do some steps to achieve them, and then like during these steps, steps you might like learn something. You might fail even twice, but then if you um, commit to that, eventually you will achieve it. Thank you. <laughs> That's such a hard one. I guess the real thing that I believe is that um, it's all about persistence. <laughs> I just never give up. The reality is that all the problems that we face are really large, but even the small bite that you personally are taking out of it is progress and step along the way. And so take that, if all you can afford to do is you can't afford to do a full national panel, do a small panel, like whatever, do something small because every way that you roll the ball forward is still progress. Yeah, keep pushing that rock up the hill. Um, my Sisyphus is my personal hero. Um, <laughs> so, um, so with that, I, I'd like to thank um, these wonderful panelists for a really engaging discussion. Um, I want to uh, thank uh, Beth for organizing this event um, and thank everyone in the audience uh, as well for, for being here. Um, and with that, we'll conclude this panel.